Uh, good morning and welcome to the 16th and last meeting of 2016 of the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Relations Committee in Session 5. Uh, I'd like to remind members and the public to turn off mobile phones and any members who are using electronic devices uh, to access uh, committee papers should ensure that they're switched to silent. Our first item of business today is for the committee to consider a number of biannual reports produced by the Scottish Government in relation to EU issues. Um, and can I invite members' views? The, um one issue I would want to flag up, which perhaps is for pursuing further with the Cabinet Secretary later, is the issue around European structural and investment funds. Um, I think it's clear from the papers that uh, the drawdown on this has been very limited thus far for the current spending programme, and I think right. that's something we'll, we should explore, we can explore with later. Cabinet Secretary, yeah. yes. Any other comments? Okay, we'll have a very brief suspension to allow our witnesses to join the table. Our second item of business today is an evidence session on the culture and tourism aspects of the Scottish Government's draft budget for 2017-2018. And I'd like to welcome today's witnesses to the meeting. Uh, from Creative Scotland, we have Janet Archer, the Chief Executive Officer, and Ian Munro, the Deputy Chief Executive. And from Visit Scotland, we have Malcolm Roughhead, the Chief Executive, and Ken Nielsen, Director of Corporate Services. Welcome. And uh, I would like to invite you to make a, a brief opening statement each. Thanks. Thank you, um, convener. Thank, um, and uh, it's great to be here. Uh, actually, the last time uh, I was here was in August at the Culture Summit, the International Culture Summit. Uh, and I had the pleasure of being part of a very feisty debate by a group of young people uh, who were participating in that event uh, in this very room. Um, so uh, I also want to apologise because I've got a cold. I've been sneezing uh, all morning. So if I splutter and sneeze through this, please do forgive me. Um, so good morning. I, I, want to, I want to start by thanking the committee for inviting us to give evidence this morning. Uh, and I think it's important to say that, of course, I'm here to represent Creative Scotland, but I'm also here to represent the very many people and organisations uh, that work across the arts, screen and creative industries in Scotland, uh, to whom we've made more than a thousand funding awards this year. And in terms of our immediate response to the budget, as you will know, our discretionary grant in aid budget for 17-18 remains relatively stable. And at 32,112, um, 000, so, so 32 million, um, a small 0.3% reduction on 26-17. Um, so we're absolutely delighted about that. The, primary purpose of this part of our budget is to support the 118 regularly funded organisations across Scotland and following a meeting of our board which took place um, on Monday we're pleased to confirm that we'll be able to continue to fund these organisations at planned levels for next year um, and uh, that's very welcomed and we currently support regularly funded organizations including some of scotland's best known cultural institutions such as the edinburgh international festival the citizens theater in glasgow eden court in inverness and lanter and stornoway and the dca in dundee with 33.5 million pounds mainly through grant and aid although this is supplemented it's important to say by some national lottery funding and in the last full year, we've just scoped out our annual review, which I believe you've had a copy of. We've seen an increase in the number of performances, festivals, exhibitions, projects, and events, and reaching those organizations are reaching more people in more parts of the country with their work 
uh, which of course is supporting jobs and skills development um, and through that the local and national economy. And in the same year we've also been able to increase the number of awards that we've made to creative individuals and organisations through our open project funding programme and that's anything from £1,000 up to £100,000 um, and we've awarded almost £12 million of lottery support to 570 uh, projects across Scotland and that sits alongside the 450 awards we made through targeted funding amounting to more than 30 million of support for key initiatives such as Time to Shine which is our youth art strategy and cash back for creativity uh, and we work really closely with young people as I've already said uh, we have something called Youth Arts Voices uh, I had the pleasure of, of meeting a group of young people earlier on in this week um, who are I have to say incredibly insightful incredibly knowledgeable incredibly determined to be able to um, contribute to painting a new landscape for culture uh, going forwards into the future for Scotland. Uh, and we find that a, a really exciting um, core part of the work that we do, uh, particularly in the run-up to 2018, which is the year of young people. And just uh, last week... Um, we were able to announce record levels of film and TV production. So 52.7 million for 15 absolutely proving that Scotland's talent crews, facilities and award-winning locations continue to be a huge attraction to major international productions. And if you go back to 2007, that figure was 23 million. Um, and uh, it went down a bit in 2010 to 21, and in 2014 it was, it was, it was just 7 million. Um, it was 7 million less than it is now. So, so it's going up incrementally. Uh, so we're seeing a real buoyancy in terms of what's being achieved. Uh, and we're really pleased to be able to fund this whole breadth and, and depth and range of work. And we're extremely grateful to the Scottish Government and in particular the Cabinet Secretary for undoubted effort. Uh, we know much work goes on behind the scenes in working out how to handle complex budget, budget decisions and we're very grateful for that. Um, committee should note that we're a distributor of funding from the National Lottery um, as well as grant and aid. National lottery funding is coming under pressure at the moment, so there's been a marked decrease in the uh, in, 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 in terms of the in, uh, income. It fluctuates, so there are trends where lottery goes up and down, but we are keeping a, a watchful eye on that. We have three routes to funding. Um, it's, across those three routes, we're about able to fund about a third of the applications that we receive. So we are continu we continue to be under pressure. Uh, there's a lot of creative potential in Scotland that's not always supported through our funding. You can't look at Creative Scotland's funded in isolation. Um, it unlocks other funding um, around uh, the work that we support. So uh, just to give you an example of that, 33 million um, goes in, 33.5 million goes into regularly funded organisations. That unlocks, um, in, in, in the 15, 16 year, that unlocked 109 million pounds from other sources through a range of different kinds of income streams. So quite significant um, and really pleased to see an increase in the amount of earned income uh, of, of between 14 and 15 million pounds, I think, um, that's, uh, that that's come through that across that year. Um, so just to conclude, a key, a key aim for us um, as set out in our recently published art strategy is to absolutely embed and, and generate understanding of the value that, uh, that, that the arts offer to society uh, through creativity. We really want to put artists, uh, the people who drive the arts, at the heart of society, the uh, valued contributors in all aspects of life, not just culturally, but also in terms of health and well-being, the economy, education and <coughs> innovation. And we know that that's really recognised in Scotland. 90% of the population believe that fun public funding for the arts, screen and creative industries is a good thing. Um, we know that the, 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 the totality of contribution to the national economy is 3.7 billion. It supports almost, almost 74,000 jobs. We know that 90% of the population take part in regular cultural activity. Um, and of course, we work with a broad range of partners, including Visit Scotland, um, in promoting Scotland as a, a location uh, for screen production and film tourism. And we also work with Visit Scotland on events and festivals uh, and promote our amazing creative and cultural offer to the world, um, which generates both visitor numbers and revenue. Um, and we think that culture has a huge role to play in the future of our country. Uh, and the ambition, talent and energy of everyone working in the arts and creative sectors is pivotal to to continued confidence and success. So I'm really looking forward to this morning's discussion. Um, thank you.
Um, Mr. Ruffhead. Thank you, convener. Um, just very briefly, a, a quick look back in terms of 2016 and the tourism industry. I'm delighted that the momentum that had been generated over the last few years has continued. Uh, in February, we launched, uh, with the help of um, all the party leaders, the Spirit of Scotland campaign, uh, which went global, and some of the detail of that is uh, in the written submission, but obviously you can go into that in more detail if you like. The events programme continued with the uh, Year of Innovation, Architecture and Design, and as Janet mentioned, uh, very much a collaborative effort with a number of agencies and the industry. And one of the big gains that, that we got in terms of events programme looking forward was the Solheim Cup, which is part of the legacy of, of the Ryder Cup. Uh, that's the, the jewel in uh, ladies' golf. Also, at Visit Scotland, um, we believe very strongly that tourism is everyone's business. But we also believe that tourism is for everyone. And in terms of inclusive tourism, we had two major projects this year, one around social tourism, where working with the Family Holidays Association uh, based uh, down in Kent, uh, we were able, through the generosity of the industry, to free up capacity and allow over 950 people who otherwise would not have been able to afford or take the time to have a break to actually do so. And that is a project that we will continue to look at growing next year with the, with the industry. We were also delighted to um, uh, host the European Network of Accessible Tourism uh, in conjunction with one of our strategic partners, which is Visit Flanders. And again, I think that demonstrates where Scotland is in terms of accessible tourism uh, across Europe. On the information provision side, our I know strategy uh, continues. We have over 700 businesses have signed up to deliver local information using their local knowledge and the passion that, that they have so that visitors' uh, experience is enriched. And my favourite, I have to say, is we focused in on pet-friendly holidays this year. And uh, I encourage you all to go to the Facebook page of uh, George, our ambassador. Uh, and you can see his uh, travels across the length and breadth of, of Scotland. So in short, tourism actually is in rude health. Uh, what we've seen is that GVA has grown since 2008 by 42%. Employment in 2015 grew by 11% to 217,000 people, the length and breadth of the country. And right now, at the moment, there's £16 billion of investment going into the industry. Uh, and I think what that does is gives us a great platform to, to go forward into 2017 with. Thank you. Much. Uh, before I open up to other members, uh, perhaps I could start... Um, with um, Ms Archer um, by asking, I understand that there has been a reduction of uh, £100,000 in the core funding of Creative Scotland, uh, which is effective real terms cut of £500,000. How does that practically impact on what you do? Um, well, first of all, I would say um, we're not entirely sure where the real term figure has come from, so we're working on understanding that. There has been a cut of £100,000, um, and we have managed to um, handle that through looking at our core administrative costs, um, which we'll reduce in order to accommodate that. Uh, so we're not... Uh, our assumptions, uh, our budget assumptions, are not that that will be passed on to the organisations or individuals that we fund. And understand that you have been asked by the Scottish Government to deliver a separate and enhanced screen unit within, uh, within the organisation. What are the budget implications of that? Uh, we're working those through. So we're working mm -hmm. in partnership with Scottish Government, um, with Scottish Enterprise, uh, with um, Scottish Funding Council and with Skills Development Scotland um, to identify um, how we might um, map out what that in, it, it, screen unit will do, um, what we can all contribute to it, um, and how we want to phase it. Um, because clearly, if we're going to build something new and ambitious, we need to we need to do that incrementally, um, in a in a in a in a practical way. So we're currently working through that process um, in in detail. Right, okay. 
I should have said um, at the outset that as well as your own organisations, there's a number of uh, cultural uh, organisations that have submitted written evidence to the committee for which we're extremely uh, grateful. Uh, one of the things that comes across in that written evidence from Scottish Opera and others who are, I understand, obviously separately funded from yourselves as national companies was this issue of... Uh, one-year funding versus three-year funding. Um, now, I know that you give grants out uh, for three years to some organisations, and that's very much appreciated. But if your own funding is on a yearly basis, what are the challenges of that? So what we do is we give um, planning figures to organisations over a three-year period um, with an annual funding agreement, uh, which is subject to review every year. Um, so if budgets change year on year, then obviously that gives us the, the, the scope to be able to change funding agreements if we need to in response to that. Um, what planning, giving planning figures does is it enables an organisation to be able to look at how we can use that to catalyse other opportunities elsewhere. So I've already referenced the 109 um, million that comes in against our 33 million. Um, it gives much, a much better confidence for the kind of conversations that organisations need to have to be able to look at how they can use our money to catalyse uh, over and above um, what, 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 what we can do directly. Um, so that's, that's why we, we offer organisations the this, 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 this scope to be able to do that. Um, with the larger companies, and, and you know, I should say, while I don't have, um, we, 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 Creative Scotland doesn't have direct, direct jurisdiction over those companies, um, my personal experience um, is very much in that territory. So um, it's, with, with larger companies, they have to plan ahead because they have to be competitive with um, other um, players in different parts of the world. So to secure um, the right casts and, and, and the right productions, you have to be able to plan often three, five years hence if you're operating in that large-scale opera context. Yes, and they made that point very well in their, their written uh, submission. So thank you very much. I'll hand over to my colleague Lewis MacDonald, MSP. Yeah, I, can we turn that last question around a little bit and, and just ask both organisations, what, what more would you be able to do if you had a three-year funding horizon or when you knew with certainty what your funding arrangements would be over a three-year period? Happy to, to take that. Um, from our perspective, we internally do look at long-term planning because similarly, if we're looking at major events, very often uh, you, know, you can be five years, ten years in, in the gestation period. Uh, likewise, on, on the business events front, uh, you could be bidding today for a major conference, but you won't actually um, secure that conference for maybe, say, five, six years' time. So we do uh, look at you know, what, our, what our forward commitments would be, and then we build that into the planning side. Right now, actually, as an organisation, we are going through a process of looking beyond 2020. So we're looking to see where, where will the tourism world take us? How, how do we shape up for that in the future? Which markets uh, should we be in? So the, the funding is certainly an element of that, but I don't think that, that should uh, stop you from doing the planning. I think from our perspective, it would enable us to manage risk. So risk management is an absolutely critical part of any business. Um, if, if we had a, a greater level of surety in terms of, of, of the forward look, uh, that would enable us to identify what the challenges are uh, and look at how we can build up solutions within that, uh, within a proper planning framework, as, a, as opposed to having to re be reactive um, on a year-on-year on -year basis. Describe an answer to the convener's question was a, a process where you reach an essentially indicative agreements with people whom you're going to fund for periods of more, more than a year and then review them depending on any change in the funding. Has that um, thus far led to you uh, uh, cancelling or reducing any funding as a result of changes in the funding coming to you? The, the, the funding has remained stable. There's one instance uh, of an organisation, you will remember the Arches in Glasgow, um, which was, was not in a position to continue um, 
not just because of our funding, but, but because of the wider market that was it, it was playing into. So its its business model needed to, need, w shifted uh, because it wasn't accessing the same level of income uh, as it had in the past. So so that's the organisation that has come out of the portfolio. So we started off our three years with 119 organisations, and then very sadly. Um, there are now 118, uh, but everybody else, unless Ian corrects me, uh, is on the same level of funding as planned. And as I say, we're really pleased that we're able to go into the third year of that that commitment um, with with with, with in, in, and, and we're able to to honour that. Um, and that's given those organisations a sense of stability. Um, it's given them, I hope, a sense of confidence, um, which is is tremendously important when one is is trying to maximise um, over and above what you get from any. any any, any public funder. Um, and I suppose it's worth pointing out that one of the things that came through uh, a very early piece of work that we did in the creative industries, which looked at the barriers to success for Scotland's creative industries, uh, interestingly, one of the th things that came through quite strongly through dialogue with um, the sector was confidence. Um, because of the volatility of the environment that people were playing into. Uh, and it was felt that if we could shore up a sense of confidence, then that would give people a sense to uh, lift themselves up into a, a, a new ways of doing things. Um, and so you can't discount the, 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 the validity and the importance of having um, the ability to be able to, to plan. Do you have concurrent cycles where as you say, 100 organisations are going into year three, but there are year two and year one, or, or do you simply have one cohort that you're managing on a three-year by three-year process? One cohort yeah. just now. Okay. Uh, we just opened up for applications um, so uh, for, for the next round, so that would be from 2018-2021, um, uh, so those, uh, the deadline for those applications is at the end of March. Um, and uh, obviously many people are now planning their applications and business cases to us, um, which will come in, we'll then review those and make decisions at the end of next year. Okay. And can I ask Visit Scotland simply the, a very similar question to the convener's opening question, which is, given a, a real terms reduction in funding, does that mean that there are things you're not able to do in the year ahead that, that you might have done had, had funding remained steady? Well, I'll let can yeah, I think on that one, maybe to, to look at the, the history to answer the going forward, is that we've operated an efficiency programme for, for many years. Uh, last year, we, we, uh, we achieved savings of 1.8 million as uh, against a target of 1.2. Uh, these savings were, were largely in procurement, or organisational change and in, in, in asset utilisation. Uh, so from 2008, we've saved 17 million uh, over that period of time against a target of, of about 8 to 9 million. So we've got a history of being able to, to make savings and we'll look to continue that as we go forward and, and into this year uh, and currently we're just uh, finalising uh, some, some property deals in Inverness, working with uh, Scottish Ambulance Services and High uh, and that will save our organisation uh, in excess of a quarter of a million pounds a year uh, and also we're undertaking some property deals with uh, Inverness, with the sorry, Highlands Council and that will save us another 40 odd thousand pounds a year. So what we have is an ongoing uh, programme of, of uh, operational savings that, that will run through into next year and that will help compensate for any real term reduction. That, that's, that's, that's something very close to a 20% reduction over uh, eight years. Clearly there's a point when efficiencies become cuts in things you want to do. Uh, how close are you to that point at this stage? Well, firstly, uh, just allow me to say that we too uh, are delighted with the outcome uh, in terms of uh, flat cash, which is um, what we received. Um, I think from our perspective, we've put a lot of effort in. It, it's not just been um, an overnight project. We've been looking forward, uh, as Ken said, over a number of years as to, to how we can maximise the efficiency of, of the organisation. Uh, and it, it, in many ways, it's also about how we spend money as well. And uh, in terms of, of media buying, we've become much more proficient. We're much more exact in, in terms of looking at what works and what doesn't. And hopefully you, you will see that from the written uh, submission in terms of the returns of, of those investments. As channels change, we, we're able, through procurement, to, to negotiate you know, better rates, better deals. And I think, to be, to be perfectly frank, it's about managing your business properly. Uh, and that's, that's what we do. And to date, we, we've not cut back on anything. And uh, looking forward into to next year, uh, we don't see the necessity to do so either. Thank you very much.
actually. Can I bring in Tavi Scott now? Let's ask a few supplementaries. To those. I mean, I always love this phrase, asset utilisation, because that usually just means closing something, doesn't it? And the, and the TIC at, t at the north end of the Keswick Bridge would be a good example, of which is all over the P&J a few weeks ago. You know, that's what we're talking about, isn't it? The, the reality. I mean, I quite understand it, but that's the reality of these things. You've, you've made some decisions like that to save some money. Isn't that the truth of it? I think the, the, the uh, well, let's go back to the information provision strategy, which is where, uh, where that emanates from. What we've looked at is uh, where's the best usage of um, the, the uh, investment that, that we make. And uh, that's where working with the industry, so we have a very good relationship, for example, with National Trust and Historic Scotland, who have bought into this whole programme. So we're helping them train up their staff so that they can deliver uh, the information. It doesn't. It doesn't make sense to have properties in places where you know they're not fully utilised. Particularly when you can actually extend the level of, of information provision through other other means. So that that means that we're able to take uh, any savings there and reinvest those in, say, for example, digital provision, mobile provision, because it is actually about a mix of, of um, channels. So part of it is about bricks and mortar, certainly. But by and large, the world is moving towards mobile technology and, and we have to move with that if uh, we're going to be relevant and salient in, in that particular space. I totally understand that. Uh, but on bricks and mortar, Fort George is a big brick and a lot of mortar. Have you got a long-term view of what's going to happen there in the context of how important that is, uh, is as a tourism facility um, over the next 20 years? Well, I know that that's, uh, there's a lot of um, uh, uh, people involved in that particular area in, in Fort George, and, and clearly conversations are still ongoing as to its sustainability. I mean, our, our view is very much about if, if there are attractions which are attractive to people, then you know, we would like to utilise those to, to the maximum effect. Okay, a couple of questions, if I may. Um, I take in the answer to, your, to the earlier questions you were getting that your both organisations would rather you had three-year settlements? From our perspective, you know, it just makes life a lot easier yeah. in terms of looking forward, in terms of planning. Uh, but, you know, we, we are where we are, sure. and, and, we, and we, de we deal with that as okay. we do. We used to have, as you well know, Malcolm, we've been a long time at this game, you know, we used to do three-year settlements in government. We're not doing them now. We'd rather Certainly not there. this year, no. No, exactly. <laughs> and, and the other side to it is, do you have a view about whether the timing of the budget, which this year is incredibly late, did that create any internal challenges in, in, in audit or accounting terms for either organisation? Not for us, no. No, no. And I suppose I would just add that, uh, I suppose I've been used to working in an environment and in, in, in other bits of, 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 of my um, working life uh, where longer settlements have been in place. But even then, uh, if, if there are pressures, um, then changes are made in year or year on year. Um, and I think it's incumbent on all of us to be adaptable and, 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 and to be able to be able to, to work within that, that kind of environment. I totally understand that, although audit Scotland always makes some observations about in-year transfers and in-year in changes for, from an auditing point of view, never mind from a parliamentary scrutiny point of view, but I take that point. Final question I wanted to ask, Vina, was the submission from the National Museums of Scotland makes a, makes a, a point about a Scottish Government pay policy and the, and the impact of that on their their organisation, would you have um, a similar observ observation in, in that they simply observe, as a matter of fact, that, that government pay policy continues to apply and it generates additional pay costs with no additional funding to support it? Would, would you concur with that view that uh, the National Museums of Scotland have forwarded to the committee this morning? Again, it's, it's, you know, from, from our perspective, it's how we manage our business. Uh, we, we're aware of, of the, the pay policy, so obviously we build that into our planning. And, and for us, it can at times be challenging, um, particularly in the instance where we've taken on um, effectively what we might call a project um, through additional funding. We've built in staff into that project. Um, and then there becomes a point when, when, when one either has to choose to, to extend a contract and make those staff permanent um, or, or, or sadly have to lose them, um, which is clearly not what you want to do if you've built up expertise within, within an organisation. So it, it does generate some, some complexity, um, but we manage it. Thank you. Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, convener. Um, I'd like to ask Malcolm Roughhead. Um, in the, uh, the draft budget, the government stated that they'll work with um, our enterprise agencies and other tourism stakeholders to promote the south of Scotland as a tourism destination. Um, 
it also says that it recognises the particular challenges faced by the, the region, its communities and businesses. I just wondered if you'd like to um, expand on how you're going to allocate uh, that, uh, that funding and what you believe the challenges that communities and business face are in the south of Scotland. Well, in, ter in terms of uh, funding, we don't break up the, the Visit Scotland budget by region. Um, uh, otherwise, you know, I, th I don't think you, you would get the, the maximum benefit of, of the money that, that we invest. We do work uh, incredibly closely with uh, Borders Council uh, and also down Dumfries and Galloway. Uh, we work with the industry there. And just recently, we've had the, the Borders uh, Tourism Conference. Uh, and for me, going forward, actually, what I would like to see is a very clear strategy uh, across the region that actually details what it is we're trying to achieve collectively, because it is about people working together. It's not just about individuals and individual organisations. We have to have common goals, common objectives, and then we can look at you know, how do we deliver that. And a great example was actually the Borders Railway, where the, there was a, a group who came together uh, part, you know, whichever organisation that, that they belonged to, they had common goals and objectives and, and uh, clear accountability and responsibility and, and I would like to think that, you know, that project was a great success. So it's not as if, you know, we don't already engage with, with the, the local authorities and the industry in that particular area, but I think what we can do is be a little bit clearer about what it is collectively we want to achieve. Um, that you are going to set out a strategy. I just wondered what you felt that the, the challenges that were facing the south of Scotland for it to be singled out within the draft budget. Well, I think the, I think the challenge is across the, the, the whole country, and I don't think they're, they're uh, particularly different uh, from, uh, say, the Highlands or, or the Islands. A lot of it is actually about getting people to work together, it's about creating critical mass. It's about looking at the attractions. How can we how can we utilise those to maximum effect? It's about accessibility into the area and around the area. Uh, it's also about making sure that their voice is heard. So using the platforms that are there, some of them will be delivered by Visit Scotland on their behalf, but there are others, obviously. Uh, so that's what I mean about a cohesive plan. So it's pulling it all together. There's lots of various assets around the place. But I just get the feeling that they're not working together, so therefore we're not getting the maximum uh, benefit from that. OK, and finally, when are we likely to um, see the strategy set out, and do you have a timeline for this? Well, we're only just beginning to, to talk to both uh, local authorities. I mean, I have to say, at the moment, we already work with the authorities, so it's much more about pulling uh, the, the various players together, which we, we'll look to do in, uh, starting uh, next year. Um, I understand that Dumfries and Galloway local authority do give you funding, but in common with the other local authorities, I don't think Borders does give you funding. Is that correct? No, so we did. We did receive. Uh, I think it was forty-seven thousand pounds. It's not on the same borders. scale as Dumfries and Galloway. It's not the same it? scale, and therefore, you know, the the level of activity uh, is commensurate with with that uh, that that uh, scale. Because what effectively we are doing is acting as an agency on their behalf. So Dumfries and Galloway, I think, put in about £130,000 uh, into marketing activity. They were able to, to benefit from uh, the efficiencies that, that we as an organisation, given the expenditure that we have, are able to negotiate on their behalf. And uh, the returns on that are actually in, in the, the written submission. But also, it, some of it's about the softer side. It's not just necessarily about the money. It, it's how we work together. Uh, and it's also about you know looking at supporting the industry to you know to, to come to the fore and work uh, closely. And this year I was down in uh, the Scottish Borders, uh, and the, you know the, there were two different um, uh, shall I say tourism groups. Uh, would it not be better that there were one? Uh, and then you know instead instead of sort of dividing the effort, you're actually coalescing. I mean, this is, um, to put it in context, this was a manifesto commitment. I'm sort of very much aware of that as a South of Scotland MSP. Um, and there's, I think it's fair to say, and I've said this to you privately, so I'll say it to you publicly, there is a feeling that perhaps, uh, you know, like since uh, the formation of Visit Scotland, there hasn't been the attention, certainly on Dumfries and Galway, that there, that there had been in the past. That's certainly uh, the local... Uh, perception. Are there any other questions on the south of Scotland before we 
move on, Ross Greer. Yeah, this is uh, just a brief and perhaps slightly silly question, but just to ask to clarify, what area are you defining as the south of Scotland? Is it those two local authorities, Dumfries and Galway, and the borders, or does it expand beyond That's that? That's part of the reason why we haven't started, because I, as far as I'm concerned, I don't think the, uh, the, the, the final area has been defined. Emma Harper. Just a comment. Um, I have done some work with Doug Wilson um, for South Scotland, and I like Rachel Hamilton and Joan McAlpin are from South Scotland, but it's just that people keep telling me that Borders is different from Dumfries and Galloway, and as long as we can highlight that there are actually, you know, people from Dumfries and Galloway don't see themselves as borderers and vice versa, so that needs to be kind of clear in the way it's marketed as well. I think people from Kelso don't see themselves as the same as Hoyek. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> can I ask, obviously, the, the, with the tourism... Um, tourism stream moving into Miss Hislop's uh, portfolio. Uh, previously it was in the economy uh, portfolio. Uh, how, does, how do these plans uh, match at all, if at all, with the plans to create a South of Scotland enterprise network? Will, that, will you be working with this um, South of Scotland Enterprise Network at all, or will you be completely separate from No, that? no, we will be part of that. Uh, be part of we that. always have been. We've, you know, wherever we've sat, uh, and, and that comes back to what I said earlier in, in my pre-ramble, if you like, which was about tourism is everybody's business. Um, you know, wherever we've sat and whichever portfolio it's been, We've always worked with, with the cultural organisations, we've worked with the, the heritage organisations and we've worked with the, the enterprise agencies. So from our perspective, you know, it, it's not any different. You know, we will continue to work with, with everybody. Okay. Uh, Stuart. Thank you, convener. Just a, a few questions predominantly around uh, tourism. Uh, but the first one is probably for both of you, actually. Just in terms of the, uh, there's an additional £17.7 .7 million for, uh, for major events. And how will, will both of your organisations actually play a part in, uh, in helping to spend uh, that money and also in help to promote uh, both the tourism element and also the cultural element? Well, from our perspective, uh, the focus is the European Championships, in, 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 and we're in discussion with Glasgow Life and, in, and, and sit on um, the board um, uh, and uh, looking at how we can build on the fantastic work that happened in 2014 um, with the Commonwealth Games and, and, and 2012 with, with the Olympics. Um, so long-standing relationships there to, to, to grow. That's also the year of children and young people. Uh, so, of course, we're looking at, at, at how that theme can weave through um, and maybe lifting Scotland into um, sort of um, celebrating the international context that that, that, that event's taking place in um, and looking at how we can um, connect young people from Scotland with young people from other parts of the world um, through that process. So that's some of the things that we're, we're doing in that space. I, I, I would just in, endorse that. I think it's the same. I mean, the, the model we've taken is very much the Commonwealth Games and the Ryder Cup. It's how do we work with partners to maximise the, the benefits of, of, of those major events. And, uh, you know, we, we've got a pretty long track record in doing so. Uh, and I don't think, you know, it'll be any different. I mean, with that, I can take it on to the okay, my next area, and that's just it's regarding the, in the Visit Scotland submission, uh, where it touches upon the countries increasingly looking to Scotland as a model of success. And in terms of the budget uh, going forward, uh, how will, um, how much it cost uh, does that actually have uh, impact upon Visit Scotland? Uh, and also, um, it can, will there be any, any effect upon what you do there? Um, uh, as a result of the, the budget that you can have for the next year. So this is in terms of the international partnerships that, yes. that we have here? Yeah. Uh, well, again, uh, over the last, I think, decade, really, we, we've been building up our, our strategic relationships. A lot of it is about knowledge exchange, um, so it's pretty low cost. Uh, uh, other areas, though, we, we've been actively involved in, in terms of uh, giving advice and support. Um, so we have strategic relationships with uh, some of the Canadian provinces um, across Europe, uh, Norway, Sweden, Iceland, uh, Malta. Um, we've put in place um, quality assurance schemes on behalf of Northern Ireland uh, and Namibia. 
Uh, on the marketing front, we've been uh, helping some of the European uh, destinations to look at how they measure uh, the, the impact and evaluation. Uh, accessible tourism, I think I mentioned earlier, you know, in, in that particular area, we, we've seen very much a, as a leader. But it's not all about, you know, sort of one-way traffic. Um, we partner up with a number so that we can learn from them as well. Uh, and the Social Tourism Initiative, I have to say, was based on work that Visit Flanders has been doing, uh, and they have been doing since uh, the First World War, um, um, as, as a kind of necessity uh, post that, that event. But we, we also work with uh, some of the Australian states, uh, and uh, just recently we seconded someone to New Zealand events to, to help them in terms of developing their own event strategy. So it's relatively low cost, but the return in terms of reputation and the knowledge that, that we gain is pretty high. Uh, you mentioned there uh, the Accessible Tourism, and I know Visit Scotland had the Accessible Tourism Conference only a couple of years ago, uh, and that's estimated to be £1.3 billion pounds to the Scottish economy with a 20% increase. Uh, now, I've raised uh, an element of that uh, within the, the cross-party group on visual impairment, <coughs> uh, which I convene. Um, predominantly, one particular area, and that's on something very, very simple on Braille menus. And I know there are two organisations uh, who actually undertake uh, Braille menus. One is uh, Morrison's and their cafes and also McDonald's. Um, but uh, in terms of Visit Scotland's um, approach, and also with, it, with the budget uh, obviously in mind, um, is, there anything, uh, is there anything else that Visit Scotland could do to actually highlight the opportunities that, that, uh, that uh, accessible tourism actually brings and also offers to uh, the wider community? Yes, I, I think the, you know, we, we're nowhere near the end of that particular journey. Um, the, firstly, what we, the, the approach we took was uh, very much looking at it from a business opportunity. Uh, and it started off, when we did the research, there was somewhere in the region of £9 billion went unspent in the UK because people weren't aware or didn't know if, if their particular uh, disability would be catered for. Uh, so obviously to, to get industry buy-in because there's, you know, it's about perception, people think that it's going to cost a lot of money, but in actual fact it can just be very simple things, uh, as you've outlined, that, that make a huge difference. So we built a number of case studies, uh, people who've been very successful in this particular area, it's far better, it's peer-to-peer -peer rather than us telling people what to do. Uh, and over the last few years, that figure has now grown, I think it was 20% increase to, to 1.3 billion. So we're not finished yet. There's a lot more that we can do. And we work very closely with, uh, with an organisation called Ewan's Guide. Uh, and they've been particularly helpful. But there are other, uh, you know, sort of uh, hearing dogs and et cetera that, that we do work with. And, uh, you know, we'll carry on to pushing that, that particular message. We've got accessibility toolkits online on visitscotland.org. But uh, as I say, there's much more that can be done. Uh, and uh, my final question, Convener, it's, uh, it's regarding marine tourism, which uh, I'm sure you won't be surprised to, to hear. Um, just in terms of uh, 2016, obviously the year of innovation, architecture and design, 2017, history, heritage and archaeology, 2018, year of young people, certainly 2019 or 2020, uh, would, uh, would you think a, a year of like, marine tourism or, or marine tourism and wildlife tourism would be something worth considering? I would like to see something like that, um, and I know uh, we've been out consulting with uh, with industry around theme years, uh, and the, um, there's a, a summary of all of that that's been pulled together in terms of what the industry feel and what the types of themes that, that they would like to see going forward, because obviously they have to, to buy into this. Uh, and I think there, there is, um, you know, there, there's definitely support for, for that as a theme going forward. So I mean, when you consider also the, the huge increase uh, in the cruise liner traffic uh, in Scotland, whether it's uh, on in the west coast as well as also uh, up in the Northern Isles, uh, and also with uh, the increase in the recreational boating, uh, and folk also coming from uh, like the Scandinavian countries into Scotland, uh, there's a huge, huge opportunity there. Uh, as, uh, as you know, as I've been uh, knocking on that door and pushing that door open for quite some time work and, and thanks to your good self and the, the cross-party group I think a lot of good work's gone into the marine strategy uh, which is there now 
uh, Sail Scotland, I think, is, is in a far better place. But it's, it's not just about the coastal waters. I mean, we, we have, you know, our inland waters. And, and if that theme were to emerge, I think it would be really good, actually, if we, if we could um, build that and integrate it into whatever takes place. OK, thank you very much. Richard Lockett. Did you have a supplementary? No, no. Richard Lockett. <clears throat> Uh, thank you. Just as Stuart McMillan very predictably raised marine tourism, I'm going to very predictably raise whisky tourism in a second or two. Uh, firstly, let me thank Visit Scotland and Creative Scotland for their contribution in 2016 to what I feel is a very vibrant arts and culture scene in the country at the moment. Uh, and tourism has got a huge buzz and you know it's, it's phenomenal to witness as I did in Sky uh, during the summer. So a lot of good things are clearly happening and, and that buzz there has to continue hopefully for future years. What I'd like to know though is in terms of the budget pressures that are going to continue given the pressure on public finances, what's the private sector doing to help boost tourism in Scotland and the creative sector? I look at the Scotch whisky sector for instance, who are exporting 34 bottles of whisky it's, you know, around the world every second. And I wonder what's the Scotch whisky sector and the multinationals behind much of that doing to promote Scotland overseas. And Creative Scotland clearly have hopefully found a role for the private sector to contribute to our, our arts and culture as well. So just to get a, a feel, there's also a debate over tourism levies taking place in Scotland. So what's the private sector doing to help? Well, from, from our perspective, we we obviously fund um, an organisation called Arts and Business Scotland, um, which is uh, set up to encourage private sector investment um, and to help organisations diversify their income streams um, and does some very proactive work in that space. Uh, I think there's more that we could do. Um, I think we could better understand the way that the organisations that we fund um, have um, connections into the private sector. Uh, clearly, um, some of our large cultural organisations have, have fantastic relationships with the private sector, and you see sponsorship coming to into festivals and programmes of work. Um, I think there's more that we can do to build on that. So what we want to do is to convene a conversation uh, with a, a, a representative group of, of, of individuals from across the private sector who have indicated interest in taking this forward um, to build a platform to, 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 to move on from. Um, and, 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 and there's lots of different things that can be done. It's not all about cash. So some of it's about expertise, um, some of it's about space, um, some of it's about um, uh, networks and, 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 and um, brokering opportunities for conversations um, that can benefit the different ways that Scotland's creative businesses work. Um, and we're, at, we're, we're, we're absolutely pointing towards that. We, in fact, at our last board meeting, um, <coughs> we, did, we, we discussed the need to, to develop uh, a, a really strong sense of what our development strategy needs to be from within Creative Scotland. Uh, and so we're, we're, we're working on that at the moment uh, so that we can take it forward. I think just uh, uh, on the, the question of, of whisky tourism, we have seen a growth in, in terms of uh, visitors to distilleries across the, uh, the country. And, uh, and I think what's encouraging is that there's a growing realisation, actually, that tourism is good for that industry as well. Um, having said that, we work very closely, actually, with a number of the distilleries. And, and if you think about malt whiskies in, in particular, there's always a, a kind of backstory to, to the, you know, the, uh, the actual brand itself, which is very helpful, actually, in terms of feeding into some of the narrative that, that we have around positioning Scotland. So if you think of the Cory Frack and all those kind of things, uh, you know, it's a very rich, uh, rich um, uh, history that, that goes with it. At a corporate level, um, we tend to work with um, distilleries, uh, particularly overseas, when uh, we're, we're doing uh, events, so we bring people in. It's all part of the, the food and drink proposition that often is very centre, uh, at the centre of, of what we're doing. Uh, and on the other level, I wouldn't forget that actually, you know, these, these distilleries are, um, or um, organisations are bringing in many, many distributors, sales agents, um, some of their own staff in terms of incentive trips, who then go away as ambassadors for Scotland. So, so I think it's looking at it in the round. 
uh, and, and looking at it, you know, from a slightly different angle, ra rather than just, you know, is, is it, uh, you know, are they bringing visitors in? They are, but in a slightly different way. I think the Scottish Whisky Sector is doing a fine job in Scotland, and the most popular visitor attraction in my constituency is a whisky distillery. However, I was really wanting to know what the chief executive of Pernod Ricard, the chief executive of Diageo, are doing to work with Visit Scotland to promote Scotland overseas? Well, I haven't had that conversation with either chief exec executive, but uh, I, I can tell you we do work with, with their uh, subsidiaries overseas, and uh, having been an employee of Diageo, uh, <laughs> I can tell you how difficult it is getting through the various corridors, but uh, we, do, we do work very, very closely with... Um, a good example would be the Macmillan uh, with Edrington. Uh, do a lot of work with them in uh, in North America. We do uh, work with some of the other brands in Asia. Slightly different, you know. It all depends on what their relative strengths are, uh, and obviously we are there to work with as many as possible rather than just a few. Uh, and in fact, actually, what you do tend to find is that some of the smaller distillers are, are much more proactive because they're trying to break into markets rather than defend the market share. So it's, in many cases, it's horses for courses. Uh, and uh, you, also, you also have the, you know, the Scotch Whiskey Heritage Association who are also pretty active and, and tend to represent all of them rather than individuals. But it, it does okay. tend to be malts that, that have the, the attraction rather than I, the I'll, I'll leave the message with you. There may be some potential there to engage at the highest level in some of the multinationals to promote Scotland overseas. Okay. Can I ask one more question, which is for, for both organisations? In terms of your budgets, and perhaps this is more for Creative uh, Scotland, I think from previous conversations, we ascertained that a large part of Creative Scotland's budget in terms of the grants go to Edinburgh. And I'd be grateful if you could clarify that and then address how we support the rest of Scotland and the cultural and artistic events there. And, um, we've got more organisations in Glasgow in our regularly funded portfolio now than Edinburgh. Um, so balance uh, across um, two cities, but increased amounts of, of, of um, work supported across the rest of Scotland. Um, so we've seen... Um, quite significant shifts, um, both through the regularly funded portfolios. So, so we're reaching out into more local authority areas than we had previously, um, both at Creative Scotland and, and through Scottish Arts Council, um, and through our open project funding. Um, and we've just announced um, uh, open project funding awards um, in the last few days. Um, so if you look at that um, release, you'll see that our work is, is reaching out into a, a, a really broad range of different kinds of places. Um, and we've committed to that uh, as part of our um, uh, investment strategy um, and we'll continue to mobilise funds uh, to as many place, places as we can. Uh, the challenge is always um, what do you not do if you want to rebalance um, and, and even out how you how you invest funds, um, and, and and that's a very that's always a, a big challenge for any any public funder. Um, and clearly, we want to build on our strengths, um, and that's that's really vital uh, if we're going to amplify uh, and maximise the the investment that we've got. Uh, I don't know, Ian, whether you want to add to any of that in terms of data. Yeah, I mean, I think um, we take the responsibility to work. Uh, across the country very seriously and if you look in our annual review for 2015-16 that we're, we're just publishing um, figure 18 of that contains the local authority breakdown um, and we'll track that year on year uh, uh, to, to understand where there is movement but I think one of the one of the bits that lies behind this is actually the capacity within uh, different geographies of Scotland to make applications that end up being successful. So when you look at the volumes sometimes, um, the application numbers are actually quite low, but the success rates are quite high in, in relation to them. Um, so part of our job is actually working across the country to, to connect with people uh, and make sure that people have a good understanding of what the opportunities are and how we can help them to get to a better position to make, uh, to make those applications. I'll, that's all open application um, side of it. What we also have is a strategic programme um, around place-based working, where we have time-limited um, strategic partnerships with different parts of the country to work with uh, 
the, the local community there, the local arts and, and creative uh, community, as well as the wider public and the uh, organisations in that area, to um, try and see how we can help work with them to see a step change in the offer in their local area to build that capacity and give rise to, um, to a kind of ripple effect that flows into the, the open applications that we have. And you'll see in our project funding that we funded the Shetland Folk Festival, we funded the East Nuke Festival, we funded the Screen Machine, which is a touring uh, cinema which travels. Um, so, so we're very focused on wanting to reach out to everyone in Scotland um, and not, not, not just um, focus on, on, on Edinburgh and Glasgow. Just a final point is, do, do you think the issue of a, a tourism levy in Edinburgh, for instance, or indeed Glasgow, would help address some of these budget issues? Well, very quickly, from my perspective, uh, you know, the, the industry view is uh, that they wouldn't like to see a levy, um, given that, you know, they, they're looking at it from a competitiveness uh, perspective. Uh, and, you know, I think, I think uh, you'd have to look at what is the business case, how would it be dis uh, distributed, you know, where does it go, transparency around the whole thing. So before, before the industry, I think we'd, we'd uh, be looking at that in a serious manner. And from a cultural perspective, clearly getting to a point where there's a recognition of the inherent value that, that culture offers in respect of tourism um, and understanding the interdependencies um, and making sense of that uh, is, 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 is clearly important because uh, it is going to be vital for us to find solutions as we move forward, uh, not just in the next three years, but in the next 10 or 20 years. Uh, and, and, and clearly a levy could play into that. But I think we all understand the sensitivities uh, and maybe there's a way that we can work together uh, to, to open up that conversation um, in, a, in a constructive way. On that, I was quite struck by the submission from Festivals Edinburgh where they broke down the uh, income from ticket sales and uh, it's quite a, they also broke down the VAT on the income from ticket sales and I was quite struck by that now given we're getting an allocation of VAT in Scotland in the future. Do you think that will change the context of the budget debate, particularly for the R's, when you see the amount of tax revenue? I think, I think it's something that should be explored um, and um, remodelling and, and, and looking at how Scotland can maximise uh, the new powers that it holds um, is, is, is absolutely critical in this mix um, right across the piece, uh, not just in terms of taxation, um, but you know, potentially also in, in, in terms of, of, of what can be done in, 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 in relation to the contribution that artists make uh, to social welfare and, and health uh, and education. Uh, are there ways that, 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 that one can incentivise a, a greater contribution um, from artists? And I suppose for me, it's uh, in the cultural space, it's about uh, not just seeing the arts and culture and tourism as a drain on resources, but actually looking at what what, what uh, these industries f contribute back uh, on, a, a on a societal level um, and an economic level, uh, as well as a cultural level, uh, and, and, and changing the dialogue, um, changing, the, changing the way that we look at things so that we can make proper sense of that. Some other questions which I was going to ask later, but I'll just ask it now. But there was another very interesting submission from Systema Scotland uh, where they talked about exactly what you're talking about, about the social value, which of course is one of uh, the Scottish Government's priorities right across its budget, tackling inequalities to make Scotland fairer. But in the, the paper from Systema, they had commissioned a piece of work by Glasgow Caledonian University into a part of their project which showed that it, there was actually an, a negative cost over time uh, because the actual money that you saved from investing in these young people um, in terms of education, in terms of perhaps even in the future criminal justice, um, meant that it, there was no cost. And I wondered, it seemed a very interesting piece of work, and I wondered whether you had done similar pieces of work in, 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 your, in your projects. We haven't done a similar piece of work um, as such because the um, obviously Systema is one organisation and we fund very many organisations and individuals. Um, and um, from my perspective, we've been sorting out the, the resetting of Creative Scotland, um, which I think we've done successfully. Uh, but 
but we're now in a position where I think we have to look forward at really understanding how um, culture and creativity can play into um, prevention um, in, a, in, a, in a societal um, uh, as a, as a, and, and, and look at what it can contribute in terms of society uh, in, 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 and, and disaggregate um, the value uh, of what that actually offers. So we, we, we most definitely are looking at that um, as something that we'll, we'll think about doing. It's complex when you're looking at the overall uh, ecosystem of, of both public subs publicly subsidised, uh, but also the, 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 the organisations that sit within the creative industries that don't receive regular public funding um, and of course there are many more of those so some 14,000 businesses work uh, operating in the creative industries they all contribute back on a societal level uh, and an economic level uh, and it's absolutely vital that we, we as the national uh, funder and development agency that we have a proper understanding of that so yes um, is the short answer it's something that we're very interested in from our perspective, we, we've been looking at social, economic and reputational impacts of events, uh, which was the catalyst again for that was 2014. Uh, and I mentioned earlier the social um, uh, tourism project that, that we've been running throughout uh, the year. Uh, and again, we're, we're looking at the, um, the health impact uh, in, in terms of attributing a cost to that, because uh, clearly that's about well-being. Uh, and I think what's quite interesting is that tourism actually is no longer being seen in this one-dimensional way, uh, and that people are actually seeing you know, how it can, how it can deliver um, social good, if, if you like, um, it, which has perhaps not been the case in the past in terms of people's perception of the industry. And if I might just um, add a line, the, it, the, it's the interdependency of all that um, sits within the art space which will always require public funding and everything else that we need to properly understand. Um, and we also need to tell the stories, I guess, of, 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 of value in, 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 in a way that has, has resonance. And um, one um, point that struck home to me was, was going to, I went to the Glasgow Women's Library uh, to meet with a, a group of young women who um, were volunteering at the library and, and, and uh, re reflecting, one of the young women was reflecting why she was interested in culture uh, as something that she wanted to pursue as a career. Uh, her father was um, in the medical profession, so he was a consultant um, in a large hospital, um, and she had uh, effectively um, studied science all her life, um, but was passionate about the arts had a chat with him, uh, talked long into the night, and resolved that she would come to the Conservatoire in Glasgow uh, because that's, that's where her heart lay. And the rationale behind that was her dad saying, um, you know, um, when it comes to the end of life, which is what I deal with, um, and I ask people what they really want to get out of their existence, things they want to do is go and see a show, read a book, watch a film, uh, commune together with other people and celebrate human existence, uh, and that's what adds value, uh, and that's what helps people, not just the people who are, who are, who are about to die, but the people who, um, who are close to them, their families and friends, that, that's what makes sense of them as human beings. Um, and that's why she decided to go into, into a cultural life, which, which they saw as being absolutely pivotal to, 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 to all of us. So uh, it's being able to tell those stories, um, as well as the hard data and numbers, uh, in a way that has coherence and, and connection that I think is really important. Do you have a supplementary? Yeah. Just a quick supplementary, really. Um, Richard Lockhead has described the whisky industry success in uh, his area, and gin has been a great success as well recently. And I just wondered if there was a, a way to promote, or have you planned to promote that in the lowlands, Scotland, as well? Because we've got a great history of whisky, and we've now got two distilleries and a gin distillery at Newton Stewart, so Annandale, Bladnoch and Crafty Gin. So would that be part of the promotion plan to help support the south southwest of Scotland? And craft beers. You also have some fantastic craft yes, beers. Yes, we do you have some great I'm not craft a gin beers. Drinker. Yeah. Um, but uh, absolutely, I mean, but that's all part of the asset base. You know, so it's taken all of that. And, and what it is is, 
it's looking at what's unique to the area and promoting that. And, and obviously, I mean, the, the, the rise in gin has been phenomenal across the country. And I think we, we are now the gin capital in terms of production uh, of, across the UK. So uh, all, of the, all of that, you know, adds together to give, in, in, when you take the sum of the parts, it actually means that it's a much more attractive proposition. So we will be building all of that into, into what we do. Very quickly, a budget question, uh, looking at the level four figures for, the, uh, for Visit Scotland. Um, capital budget is reduced um, this coming year. Now, the Scottish Government's tag says this capital budget is for refurbishment of the estate and for investing in the digital strategy and ICT resources. So where is, where is that reduction coming? Uh, and, and again, what's it, or, or is, is it reflecting a planned reduction in spend, or is it simply re investing less in the future strategy? Well, we're still really to commence the allocation of, of that into next year's budget and programme just now. Um, what we have is we do have a, a budget put aside for a refurbishment programme that won't run through capital, and, and that money's secure in, in there in terms of just a maintenance, uh, ongoing uh, preventative maintenance. Uh, so what we'll look to do with that money, uh, currently there's, there's two potential projects that we'll look to do. One would be in, in Edinburgh, um, where we would look to uh, do work in the Princess Street VIC, which is uh, by far the, the, the most uh, used VIC that we have across the country. Uh, and the, the other one would be uh, actually uh, looking at, again, the digital infrastructure that we've got in, in terms of the organisation and look at the um, the... the, the, the what's called the DMS and the CMS, some of the underpinnings of the website. You've had flat cash for the last couple of years. You're not enjoying that this year, so which of those is likely to take the hit? I think we'll probably be able to do both. We'll just need to really Reduce plan it very, very well, Lewis, make sure we can, we can run that through. OK. And, and, and a more general question for both, which may have an impact on the agencies, um, certainly has an impact on the sectors. We've had a low value pound in the last few months. There's not much that's predictable about the wider economy in the next few months, but one thing that's a fair guess is that the pound will continue to struggle. Um, what's the impact been thus far on the sector, and is there an impact on the agency? And I think that's really for both. Yeah. Well, impact in terms of our ability to operate overseas is relatively limited because um, at this stage, anyway, um, the, the bulk of our expenditure is in the UK. Uh, and uh, a lot of the, the contracts that we have have been signed in advance. So, you know, we haven't, we haven't been immediately impacted by, by the variances. In terms of the industry, uh, yes, I mean, the, um, the, the strength of the pound works both ways. It means it's a bit more expensive for people to leave these shores. Um, if you want to hear me complain about that. Uh, and therefore, you know, the attraction is to stay in Scotland and around Scotland. And uh, obviously, in terms of people coming into Scotland, it makes it more attractive uh, as well. But uh, I think the, you know, what we have to, to remember is that you know, short-term currency fluctuations are, are no answer to long-term uh, strategic and uh, sustainable practices. And so, whilst we take advantage of it on a tactical basis, I think we, we do need to look beyond that and, and look at our competitiveness overall, which is not just about price. And from an art, uh, arts perspective, 80% of our organisations work internationally. Um, clearly, there are uh, in barriers in, 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 in terms of some of the work that, that takes place in other, in other countries. Um, touring um, internationally uh, is becoming harder. Um, we've actually commissioned some work uh, which we've published on the impact of Brexit. Um, so that's available on our website if you want to reference it. Um, from a screen perspective, we are seeing enhanced numbers of productions wanting to come into Scotland, into the UK, and taking advantage of the tax credit, um, which is great. Um, and so that's obviously um, fueling um, more employment opportunities in Scotland when productions come in for, for, for crews and, and, and so on. So, um, so that's, 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 that's the positive side. Just finally, the government has... Uh, uh, announced plans to reduce um, air passenger duty. Um, what is the likely budgetary impact likely to be on your different sectors, in your view? Um, <clears throat> we, we've had a look at uh, some of the average prices. It's always very difficult, of course, because air, airline pricing fluctuates according to demand. But 
we, uh, we had a look at um, markets which are new. So India was one. Uh, and if you took the average current price into, into London from Delhi uh, and, and transferred that directly into coming to Scotland, it would take about seven and a half percent off the off the price, you know, in, in, that a uh, a visitor would would have to pay. Um, clearly, the biggest part of our market uh, is uh, still Europe, um, and uh, sixty percent of the visitors, uh, international visitors, come from Europe. So the impact is is perhaps um, slightly less lessened, you know, because obviously the the duty itself is not as great uh, on the ticket price but it certainly have a positive impact. And so clearly we welcome that too. Uh, as I've said, we, we, uh, cultural organisations trade internationally um, quite prolifically. Um, and I suppose uh, we haven't done the numbers, um, but, but we also, uh, of course, do um, a level of international travel directly ourselves as a staff um, in, in, in brokering opportunities for the cultural sector to, to function. Um, and so one could uh, look at uh, how that um, saving is going to reflect in terms of contrib contributing towards the £100,000 that we've lost from our, our grant in aid. Um, not quite sure whether that would offset it completely, but it would certainly contribute towards it. I know there are some supplementaries, but the Cabinet Secretary's are arrived, so I'm going to have to um, suspend the session now. But thank you very much to our witnesses, and we'll have a brief suspension before our next witness.
Item of business today is an evidence session with the Cabinet Secretary for Culture, Europe and External Affairs on the Scottish Government's draft budget for 2017-18. Um, welcome, uh, Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop, uh, Bettina Sizeland, Deputy Director for Tourism and Major Events, and David Sears, Head of Sponsorship and Funding with the Scottish Government. Uh, thank you all for, for coming to speak to us today. Um, can I um, open with, I understand, looking at the draft budget, that um, the 2017-18 draft budget shows a cash increase of 2.4 million in the total external affairs budget. Uh, and in real terms, that in equates to an increase of 16.2%. But I also understand that you know, the, the European uh, line of the budget uh, ha has, been, has been reduced. Now, in the context of Brexit, uh, many people looking at that on the surface will, will find that rather surprising. And I wondered if you'd like to comment on that. Okay, well, the external affairs budget includes manifesto commitments which have been realised, um, particularly around international development and humanitarian aid. So the, 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 the strategy that was produced yes, and uh, published yesterday by Alistair Allen on international development in, uh, obviously is supported by an increase of a million pounds to 10 million pounds in terms of the external affairs budget. And also we have a manifesto commitment that's covered in the budget for uh, a new funding line of humanitarian aid of a million pounds. So that covers quite a lot of the uh, the increase in the budget. In terms of the, the changes, um, if you also look in terms of the, the level four that was produced for you, you'll notice there's a new line um, that wasn't there previously for the Brussels office. And if you look at the European strategy line and the Brussels office line, you will identify that actually there's a net increase in terms of activity. Because clearly, as we know, we've had to readjust not just for next year, but within the year uh, in some of the changes that we've had to, to, to deal with in making sure that we're geared up to deal with the, you know, the, the, the consequences of the European referendum and our engagement in Brussels. So there's a new line for the Brussels office, uh, which uh, is where a great deal of the European strategy uh, funding now is located. The other thing to, to refer to is the fact that previously, prior to uh, May, the Culture and European External Affairs uh, strategic function sat as one unit. What's happened since the election in May, uh, culture now lies within uh, a different part of government and enterprise and the external affairs um, uh, uh, line and in terms of organisation is separate. We ha used to have one directorate, we now have two directorates. So some of that funding that had previously been in that line uh, would be between the two, two areas. So the, net, the, net in the, the important thing is that there is a net increase in resources that is available to support our activities for uh, European activity post-Brexit. Uh, it's just organised in different lines and the new Brussels, li Brussels line, uh, which is over a million pounds, is a new line. So that, that, I'm sure that's very welcome. Um, in terms of this committee's previous scrutiny of, of the budget, there, there were some concerns by the previous committee about underspends uh, in the budget and also uh, miscellaneous allocations of the budget to, to, other, um, to other departments. Given the situation with Brexit, is that something that you think will um, be eliminated in, in future? Well, you, if, if you absolutely specified everything, uh, in a, in a, particularly for this year, you know, for, for this type of portfolio, which is, a, remember, a relatively, in terms of expenditure, smaller portfolio budget compared to other areas, you would not have flexibility to, for example, deal with a European referendum result that we did not want. You, know, you have to have flexibility to be able to deal in the year. And also, uh, the evidence I've given previously to the previous uh, committee was... Uh, the fact that we can actually mobilise more resources across government by being flexible across government. Uh, some areas, whether it's climate change, um, climate justice, or indeed working with other departments, uh, enterprise, for example, in certain areas. Some of the changes in the year last year, which obviously not, you're not discussing last year's budget, but this year's, but last year in particular, around some of the issues around um, advice on immigration, etc., identifying where's the best place to do that. Uh, some of it was in relation to uh, business, for example. So some of the last year's changes was working with uh, some of the enterprise lines to transfer some of the business advice for immigration in relation to talent skills was transferred over to enterprise. And similarly, if you think about um, relations to local government, uh, 
uh, uh, support for refugees, some of the issues around the mig migration line, that's moved. So it's not, they're, they're moving for good reason, they're moving for flexibility, and it's not always one way. Uh, sometimes we can get flexibility back as well. And I think that's the point of it. I know you want to be, I know I've got to be accountable to the Parliament in terms of where the spend is, but in a budget such as ours, it's not, uh, it's not large amounts of underspend, but it allows that flexibility for, for movement. But I'm, you know, when there is change in movement in year, I'm more than happy to make sure that the committee is aware of when those movements are happening, or certainly um, in order for you to track what that, that is. But you've answered my next question. All my right. next question was going to be about the migration budget line, which had reduced slightly, and we've obviously taken a, a lot of evidence in this committee about the importance of, of, of migrants, but you're saying that's moved to different, different departments. Just before I move on and, and invite colleagues to come in, um, you'll be aware that at a, a UK level of the, the leaked Deloitte paper um, advising the UK government about the implications of Brexit, and uh, it warned that an, another 30,000 civil servants would be needed, which is um, really uh, quite eye-watering. Um, how are you, you know, given what they outlined to the UK government uh, as to the impact on um, the bureaucracy and also budgetary impact. Um, is that something that, that you're concerned about? You know, that presumably that will have a knock-on effect here. If they need 30,000 additional civil servants, presumably there's a resource implication for ourselves as, as well. And also, um, if the UK government does have to hire all these additional civil servants, will there be Barnet consequentials for Scotland as a result of that? You'll be aware that uh, the Scottish Government doesn't have uh, powers in terms of the civil service. That's still a, a reserved and retained uh, responsibility for the Westminster Government. But clearly, uh, if a, as a consequence, a direct consequence of a UK Government decision, uh, which the EU referendum and obviously then the subsequent result is, and it requires additional resource to, to deal with that, a lot of the areas, as we know, have impact, particularly around, if you think about the uh, devolved uh, competencies, agriculture, culture, uh, justice, fishing, um, health, education, all the different areas where there is some uh, European competence that we would need to identify what we would need to do as a consequence. Gearing up of the UK civil service in terms of numbers would have a direct con consequence for us and therefore the responsibility as a direct result of the actions of the UK government in uh, causing the, the, the consequence of the activity that Deloitte uh, have ident has identified, subsequently denied by the UK government, but I mean, everybody recognises the amount of resource that's going to be required there should be a consequential, I would expect, in terms of how the civil service uh, resourcing could have an impact for, for Scotland. How we've organised ourselves, um, we've worked uh, very, very hard to ensure that cross-government, that every department clearly is going to be impacted by the decision, um, and even the, you know, the activity to date has been involving um, every part of government. So even my cultural side of my portfolio will have been involved and has been involved in identifying some of the issues in, uh, that of concern and are involved, including on, on tourism as well. Uh, in terms of uh, the strategic uh, work activity um, and the thinking and publication of the document uh, of this week, that activity has been uh, primarily led by civil servants in my department, and uh, obviously Mike Russell is the the uh, minister for you know UK negotiations, um, has been very much part of that from a ministerial point of view. But we have got very good and talented people. We've been had a European focus for some time. I've tried very hard. I've related to previous committees here is to ensure that cross government. We have always had a, um, a, a kind of European dimension and aspect of what we're doing to have that awareness. So I expect every part of government to be involved in the consequences. But as you, as you point out, if, the, if this department, so if this committee wanted to um, help argue the case with the UK government on resources for staffing and civil servants, that would be a very welcome um, uh, proposition from this committee, should you choose with to. the committee that, um, for example, negotiate and trade deals, for example, if this mm -hmm. all done at UK level, what happens to um, your Scotland's interests? Who's, who, who's in there representing Scotland? Um, I'll just hand over to my colleague, Lewis MacDonald. Thanks very much. And, and, uh, in, uh, in relation to Europe in particular, one of the uh, front doors, if you like, for communities around Scotland is the provision of structural funding. And I know you helpfully responded to the convener last week in your letter about where we are with some of the structural funding issues. So I just wanted to um, uh, pursue one or two of those points. Uh, and, and first of all, the issue of... 
uh, the current programme, the 2014 to 2020 programme for European structural and investment funds. Clearly, we're halfway through that uh, period, and it appears that uh, the level of commitment is still less than 50%. But what I was interested to understand was what level of spend there has been. So I think the numbers in your letter say that 383 million out of uh, 800 million or so has been committed. Uh, but I was keen to understand how much has actually been spent uh, and uh, where that all stands. Uh, clearly, I, and I've you know, provided one letter covering the budget, which is obviously sure. the, which is the my my understanding was the subject for this committee's. Uh, 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 session was on the budget, but I know that the, con the convener had asked about additional information. I, I'm not responsible, as the, I'm not the lead minister responsible for structural funds, so I think if you've got any further questions to that which was provided in an annex, I just, we just provided one government letter in response uh, because of time to the committee. Um, but in terms of the structural funds issues, I'm more than happy to collect your uh, your, your, your issues and concerns and questions and get the appropriate um, Minister, Cabinet Secretary to reply to you. I think that would be helpful because I think I, I understand the point that the day-to-day the, the -day responsibility for uh, uh, this area lies with Keith Brown, but, yeah, yeah, but, but, but clearly from a, 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 the point of view of the Government's accountability to this committee uh, and as a member of the Cabinet you will be aware of some of the issues that have arisen around European uh, programme funding and I'm sure aware of some of the anxieties around where we stand with the current programme. In terms of our general government approach, I mean, we're very conscious of the one, the importance to, to ensure and the commitment for the spend and particularly the allocation the, the, and the responsibility of the UK government for the period 14 to 20, and also recognising that the potential difficulties that we're anticipating because of the Brexit vote will mean actually in terms of the economic activity, making sure we've got a stimulus early in the period, as we did, if you remember, during the 2009 uh, recession, one of the things that we did was bring forward and front load some of the, the European funding to help uh, deliberate and very decisively um, to help counter some of the recession issues around about that, the 2009 10 period. Um, so that's a kind of general approach, but uh, in terms of the actual spend levels, I wouldn't want to mislead you but because I'd, it's not an area that I have direct responsibility for. Fair, 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 fair enough and, and, and completely understood. I wonder um, one other factual question, then, which you may be in a position to answer in relation to this, is the question of when. Uh, because we've had the UK government's assurances, those have been reiterated by the Scottish Government, but when will the gate close uh, for, for European funded projects? Will it be 2020 or will it be 2019? Is that, well, is that it, one on which you're able to give an answer today? I, I think it depends, <laughs> and it doesn't depend on us, unfortunately. The, the ball is most definitely in the uh, UK government's uh, court as to what they would they would do and when they would see exit and what type of exit they would want and whether they would want anything that has, for example, if they were, in, uh, you know, whatever the, the solution they come up with, but uh, if there's continued commitment to uh, involvement in any of the funding arrangements of any shape or form, then clearly we would expect something further. And the real problem we've got is, as of now, and this is where I probably have more direct responsibility or understanding is, in terms of if there's an exit that is before 2020, then clearly, and it's a clean break and it's a hard Brexit and that's the end of everything, nobody will be anticipating necessarily any continued funding streams unless there's arrangements made for things like, very important to us, Horizon 2020 or some of the other Erasmus, Interreg, all the things, you know, things we think are good programmes and why we want to continue that relationship. But that would very much depend on whether there is a... Um, the type of exit that they negotiate, whether there's a, any transition programme, whether there's any phasing. Uh, but the problem we've got is if there is anything further, and I think it's in Scotland's interest that we can be involved in as many of the useful structural funds and other funding like Horizon 2020 that we can be, the negotiation period for that will be starting much, much sooner, in two, you know, and, and in 2018, etc. So the, we're already, as of now, things, whether it's, I know the area that this committee has also been interested in, digital single market or other areas, we want to make sure that we're maximising our position come what may, and the negotiating uh, clout or influence or impact that the UK government uh, can have is already rapidly slipping away and that would be to the detriment of Scotland. Without asking you to look beyond where we can see at the moment, is it your understanding that the commitments that have been given around structural funding for the 2014-20 programme 
are for the duration of that program, regardless of the precise date of yeah, Brexit. I, I would say that's my, my understanding, but the actual financial commitment is still a lot to be desired, and I think that's the area where actually the UK government has not given us as firm a commitment as we need in a lot, a lot of these areas. But as I said, I'll, I'll get Keith Brown to give you more information um, to, to the committee if that's an area, but maybe perhaps your clerks could uh, collect the, the areas of interest and we could follow that up in the new year. Thank you very much. That's appreciated. Tavish Scott, was yours a supplementary? Right, OK, supplementary. Um, can I, thank you. Can I just further to Lewis MacDonald's question, just clarify that, um, that the issue of structural funds has been, as it were, repeatedly, or not repeatedly, but, but regularly discussed at the intergovernmental meetings that have been taking place and that, the, that Mr Russell's been informing this committee of? Well, in terms of the structural fund, I think, I think Mike Russell's involvement in the UK government has been about the negotiation on Brexit. Uh, Alistair Allen has been attending the Joint Ministerial Committee on Europe, which is related to the ongoing. You know, some of this is to do with the ongoing, and that's why it's really important that we don't, you know, we don't think everything is just about the Bre Brexit situation. It's how do we make sure we don't lose ground between now and the actual uh, UK, you know, UK leaving? Um, unfortunately, and I'll, I'll, unfortunately, the, I think the time attention uh, that the UK government is placing on the regular work and the continuing work until 2020 or otherwise has not been at the level it should have been, and it's something that you know we. Are impressing and we will continue to and part of our responsibility is to keep them to pace on the exist, existing I, I, items and there was a um, uh, th th there has been problems with the holding of the joint ministerial committee in Europe there has been one uh, since the the uh, the EU referendum, but my concern is that it has not been given the attention it needs to, and that's where the structural, you know, the issue of the ongoing issues around the structural funds uh, should be addressed. The issues I think where you may be getting to is what would their future relationship be in structural funds would be an area that Mike Russell would be involved in, in terms of what might come uh, as a result of that. And I think again, uh, I, a lot of the thinking, I think, in Scotland is ahead of some of the thinking that's elsewhere. I'm just saying that we've, and we know the importance of you know, Horizon 2020. Your committee's done a huge amount of evidence gathering on that, and a, and a really useful job to identify the kind of areas where whatever happens, we want a continuing relationship. And I think drilling down on some of those interregs quite an interesting one because it's one where other countries, other EU countries, have an interest in working with us. Horizon 2020 clearly because it's not just financial; it's about, as we know, it's the relationship that people have with the, 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 the fantastic academics that we have here. So I think doing more work from the committee and, 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 and keeping pace on what the UK is doing on that and from what we can provide you with our understanding of what the priorities are. But I think we maybe need to separate the difference between the day-to-day uh, -day operation of the existing relationship and what the future one might be. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just think, I mean, they're, they're providing now a running commentary, so it's all very entertaining to watch in the sense that they used to say they weren't going to have a running commentary, and now they absolutely certainly do. But my other, my other supplementary was to the convener's questions earlier on. We've, we've obviously had Creative Scotland and, and um, Visit Scotland in front of us just before now, and they both, um, not so much argued, but certainly would welcome a return to three-year funding uh, to provide that continuity across government and across their, their um, work. Uh, does, does the government plan in overall terms to get back to uh, something I think we all in principle agree with, which is a, an approach to finance which is on, on the basis of three-year funding rather than year-in-year -year settlements? In my understanding is we want to, to be able to return yeah. to this. This is a very unusual year totally. for, for lots of different uh, yeah. reasons. Our election, uh, late autumn statement and the consequences of European referendum. Yeah. So, but we're, we're very conscious of the, the, the importance of being able to plan ahead. A lot of the organisations are planning ahead, on a, a, a particularly cultural organisations, um, on and you know, they're, they're, they're arranging uh, years in advance of what they're doing. And we've, try, we've tried, and I've tried as a culture minister, whatever the challenging um, circumstances, um, to try and give them a sense of stability um, so that they can have, uh, we, they, they, you know, we, we can try and support them as well as we can do. Um, and so that stability has been helpful. Uh, but obviously it's easier if it's over a longer period. But you know, that's not a decision for me. That's a decision for the Finance Secretary and the Cabinet more widely. But uh, from my point of view, um, I, I would argue in favour of that, for particularly for our organisations. Uh, what's interesting about the culture uh, uh, brief in particular is uh, most of the resources go out the door immediately in terms of uh, organisations and companies, um, and they have, uh, you know, they're having to rely on different funding streams, not just us. But actually, having um, Scottish government uh, underpinning uh, gives them confidence, therefore, to go out and seek other funding from philanthropists, private donations, whatever. And we're very conscious of our, our role in that. Thank you, Emma Harper. Thank you, convener. Um, good morning, cabinet secretary, and everybody. Um, 
You mentioned about the International Development and Humanitarian Fund. Um, and I'm going to read from my notes just to make sure I get my numbers accurate. It says the International Development Fund accounts for a large proportion of the external affairs budget and it's been increased from 1 million to 10 million. So I'm wondering what the objectives of the International Development Fund are and how this increase in budget will be spent and also how the new fund uh, of the Humanitarian Fund, how will that operate and then complement the International Development Fund? Well, we just uh, published yesterday, Alistair Allen published the International Development Strategy. It's been subject to consultation through the best part of this year. Um, and it may be a, a, an area, that the actual policy side of it, you might want to come back to with Alistair Allen at, at some point um, in the future. What has happened is we've, we've, we've identified that, you know, the commitment for, to Scotland internationally in terms of charity, international development is very, very strong. Um, the commitment of this institution as parliament to Malawi and the people of Scotland to Malawi is very, very strong. And it's something that you know we've, we value. It's not just about tackling inequalities at home, it's also about tackling inequalities globally. Um, and uh, it was a commitment in our manifesto. The I suppose the, the, to, to give you a kind of what is different, um, shorthand is that we have we've focused on four countries. Uh, previously, there were a, you know, other countries we were involved in. Indeed, uh, this committee in its previous um, iteration had previously said, look, you know, are you spreading yourself too thin or can you concentrate a relatively small amount in the big scheme of things? Obviously, international development um, is, uh, and the different budget is far, far, far bigger than anything that we have. Uh, but the areas that we're uh, it's, uh, concentrating on, Malawi, Rwanda, Tanzania and Pakistan, particularly in relation to education and women. So that's the, the kind of focus we're having in, the, in, in that. Um, a lot of what we're doing, again, is trying to work um, additionally with other areas. I, I referenced earlier, for example, the Climate Justice Fund isn't funded from here. It's funded from um, another part of government. Uh, I was always clear that that should be separate and additional. Uh, some of the things that we're doing around climate justice, for example, that you know, we were the first country, I think, in the world to, to commit to um, the Climate Justice Fund and, and allocate funding there, but that's a separate part of government. It's not in this budget. But also in terms of the Millennium Goals and, and how we can uh, uh, deliver on those that both domestically and internationally. And a lot of the focus will be on, on women as well. Um, some of the work we're doing, particularly around um, peace reconciliation, we've been identified as a, an area by the United Nations. We've done some training and work with Syrian women. And, and one of the reasons is because this parliament as a whole had a strong commitment to women and democracy. Um, we have three women leaders. Um, and that, again, was one of the reasons why um, the United Nations were keen to, to work with us on that working activity as well. On humanitarian fund, I mean, clearly you'll, you'll, you'll be aware that just within the last few weeks, the Scottish Government announced funding for uh, Yemen and um, sorry, uh, to make sure that we can uh, provide our support in, in that activity. Why is that important? Because when you've got a DEC appeal, a Disasters Emergency Committee appeal, we know from experience commitment from government can be an encouragement for other people to give. And it's well over a million pounds has been donated uh, since that DEC appeal was launched just the other week from Scotland. I think it's uh, 11 million uh, UK wide. Previously, when there's been humanitarian disasters, I've had to, to, to identify for, for, for the Philippines or other areas where the Scottish people want the Scottish government to step up to the mark. We've had to sometimes have to go to other parts of government and it's quite difficult sometimes in tight budgets and you know there may not be the underspends that there may have been in previous years everything's been very tight and our, our ability necessarily to be able to deliver uh, humanitarian support was really getting quite stretched at a time when actually it would help particularly around disasters emergency committee appeals and we work very much across the Scottish committee and obviously in timing with the a deck appeal from the UK so it was felt that it'd be better to have it as a standalone fund but Again, as the Dallas the, the lead uh, minister in this area, so I'm sure at some point the committee will want to engage with him. Do you think there's a, an understanding amongst the, the wider public out there that Scotland already contributes to the UK international uh, development budget through its taxes? So what we are providing in Scotland, uh, what you're providing in Scotland is in addition to that. Do you think there's an understanding of that? Uh, I, I, I'm not sure uh, the degree to which it, there is, but I think there generally is. I think there's an expectation that Scotland is a, you know, is a humanitarian country, has internet. I mean, I'm not saying that the rest of the United Kingdom doesn't, but there is a, if you look at the responses from Scotland to 
international charity work is very, very strong. And the commitment, I think, I think what's interesting about Scotland is the, the personal commitment of people to people activity. I mean, the, the inter what interests other countries, and I remember speaking to a former European Commission international um, development uh, commissioner, the, is that because we cannot provide and don't provide funding direct to government because we're, as you said, you know, uh, international development is reserved and, and we're not able to do that. A lot of our um, our, our international development work is 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 uh, agreed certainly with other governments like Malawi, uh, but it's not direct to the government and it's project to pro project. But our our civic um, reach is is phenomenal. The, the the Malawi reach. I'm sure everybody around this you know this table will know people in their own town villages and constituencies that have a relationship with uh, Malawi in some shape or form um, and the activity now also um, looking at Rwanda and Tanzania will be, be important as well. There has been some uh, uh, criticism in the more rabid aspects of the the, pre the tabloid press of the UK's government's uh, funding to, to some other governments. Do you think that the fact that your money goes, as you've said, direct to projects, direct to NGOs, that it's actually, from a budget point of view, is actually easier to track where the money's going and the outcomes that you're achieving as a result of that than perhaps with the UK, where there's large amounts of money going to foreign governments? I think it is. And I think that's also, again, I've spoken I remember speaking to a, a former um, international development minister, or for, sorry, foreign Commonwealth uh, minister in Whitehall at the time where they were withdrawing funding from the Malawi government directly, for example, and they were interested in our, our model and how we did that and how that perhaps during a, a sort of interim period uh, they could actually you know, do something similar in terms of, of their activity. And that's also, I think, what the European Commission was interested in is the people to people and the organisation. It's more sustainable, the relationships as well are very strong. I'm not saying you can replace it and you know that I'm not saying that the I would change a model that you couldn't provide thing, uh, funding direct from the UK to, to governments, but it is an interesting model. And I think that civic relationship is really important because some of these issues are not necessarily just around um, providing, for example, as we are currently, um, support for hardships the Malawi floods, for example, some of the kind of issues that we've, and additional funding we've been finding this year to try and help support that. It's not just about that. Malawi has been issues around um, the state and the standards of prisons, um, mental health issues, again, uh, areas where actual relationships between professionals have been very important. And so actually it mobilises different parts of civic society to think about what they can provide as well. And a lot of interesting, the climate justice issues that have been coming through as well have come through relationships that universities have managed to, to provide and identify as well. So, And there are also the kind of lessons there in the projects that people are very interested in. And a lot of the issues, as we know, around international development, it's about sustainability and particularly around um, how you can have sustainable, resilient communities. And some of the things, about, like, for example, tackling uh, some of the issues around uh, uh, HIV and AIDS in Malawi is actually about um, civic society and relationships and power relationships as well that are going on in terms of the position of women. So empowering women has been a very important part of what we've been doing, but we've been doing it very much with people on the ground. Uh, our challenge probably is how you monitor that effectively, because obviously uh, any international aid has been monitored effectively and with what is a relatively small budget in the, the, the scheme of international development in the world. I think we would be rightly criticised for spending too much time uh, and too much resource on administration. And what you really want to do is make sure your spend is impacting on people directly. I think the UK can learn from that approach that you're taking. I, I think they're interested in, in our approach, but obviously, um, you know, I'm, 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 you know, I'm, our, our job is to share where we can, where we've got good practice. But I'm not going to underestimate the fact that you, we have many, many effective professionals uh, operating and working out of East Kilbride, where Diffid is located, um, and they are interested in what we are doing. But I'm not going to, I'm not going to preach to them. Um, but I'm sure that we, when we have the opportunity to share, we can and we will. Okay, Ross Greer. It was on the uh, international trade hubs that the Scottish government's announced, um, or the First Minister announced the uh, opening of a trade hub in Berlin. I was just wondering if that will have a very specific focus as a trade hub, 
or if it will have a wider focus more similar to the North American and Brussels offices that come under your remit, uh, remit Cabinet Secretary? Um, well, well part, part of my uh, wider responsibility is to make sure that we're promoting Scotland internationally in whatever shape or form, and indeed um, in my visits uh, uh, internationally, um, I always uh, pursue the trade agenda very, very strongly indeed, uh, and particularly around some of our very strong export uh, opportunities around food and drink, etc. Which is, and food and drink have, have been um, remarkably successful, and particularly in the European market. And, and that's some of the challenges we have actually post Brexit is around the food and drink sector in, in particular. We've recently um, opened a hub in, in Dublin. Uh, the activity has been very much to try and reinforce and emphasise the activity we've been doing around. Uh, uh, Irish relations in terms of the opportunities around trade, of which food and drink is one, but there are others, energy, different companies, activity in the First Minister, and a visit, very successful visit to Dublin recently. It was energy was one of the key focus for input and development. So in relation to all our, um, our approach to innovation investment hubs, clearly there's an economic drive, but a lot of the economic um, uh, activity will depend on some of the relationships you can have with government as well. That will vary from country to country, so uh, it's less so in the States, but it's absolutely the case in other countries like you know where if you're doing um, activity in other countries where the intergovernmental relations are really important and having a ministerial visit or ministerial connections can make a difference for, for their investment. So I would expect the uh, Berlin office to cover yes business but also culture creativity as well um, in terms of our international relations that's as important as what we can do have a hub for that um, and it'd be also a hub for tourism again a lot of our work if you look at with SDI they also work with Visit Scotland a lot. Of you, I'm not sure what evidence. I didn't hear all the evidence uh, from uh, the previous session. But Visit Scotland itself obviously is operating a great deal internationally in terms of the marketing. So it's how, the innovation and investment hub is how can we be better value for everybody and provide a hub, not just for government, but also as a landing base for those that are operating, for example, universities, huge opportunities for them, uh, perhaps, again, restricted by what's happening in terms of um, Brexit. But you know, we want to make sure that we are open for business, uh, that we are uh, trying to pursue as much investment opportunities and activity as we can. And also intergovernment relations can be important as well. And having a base from which you can then have that activity uh, is, is very important indeed. And, and that goes for the London hub as well, because uh, clearly um, that, that, that will also provide a focus for us. And how will the success measures beyond economic measures be uh, observed? Uh, I, I, it's a good question, but not not an easy answer. Um, because obviously, in terms of uh, diplomacy or soft diplomacy, it's not something that you necessarily broadcast, shout about. You just get on and do. And it's about the activity and the relations of how you can then have good and successful relations with with different governments. Some of it is on policy, common policy issues. Um, so, for example, you know, particularly in relation to France, you know, I've met twice with the European Minister there. Um, a lot of the focus has been on education and culture because they're very keen to continue the. The, the, the agreements and the understandings that we've we've uh, developed with them, but also uh, it's an opportunity for us to to have exchanges um, about common common interests. So, for example, in my previous um, my last visit to to Paris, I also met with the head of the Refugee and Immigration Service, who was looking was just I met him in an empty. Uh, it was an empty shell of an office where he was just he'd just been appointed to gear up with uh, gear up how uh, France was going to deal with the, the large influx of refugees and they were interested in what we were doing as well um, in terms of uh, our, our activity in supporting refugees and the community and social aspects so you know, how do you measure the success of that that sharing of information sharing of knowledge sharing of experience and sharing of common agenda and you know you could and, and you know people write extensively about soft diplomacy um, and soft power I, I, I don't particularly like the phrase but you know again how you measure that is, is a big challenge um, but you know having over 20 uh, governments represented in this parliament during the culture summit during August I think is a very good sign of the value in which Scotland has held uh, both in a, a, a government sense but primarily in a, in a cultural sense so putting, putting a, a kind of pound pence measure on some of these activities I think would be misplaced but I think it's worth Thing, are these things important to us? Yes, they are. Can we have impact in terms of the profile of Scotland? Yes, you can measure it through the Arnold uh, 
um, brand index, for example, Scotland's positioning. But actually, some of these things are more, far more subtle, far more nuanced. And I think as the Scottish Parliament and indeed the Scottish Government has developed over the last period since 1999, where we are now in our international relations is night and day than obviously where we were in 2000. And that's a sense of the maturity of the institutions and the relationships and the credibility and the integrity and the experience that we've developed. And that counts as much for this Parliament and the committees of this Parliament as it does for government. And just uh, finally, very briefly, with our relationship with the rest of Europe changing, are there considerations to expand the number of trade hubs, particularly in Eastern Europe and Scandinavia? Well, um, I've, I've asked Alessand to pursue our Nordic uh, Baltic um, uh, strategy and policy thinking because there's great opportunities there that we need to, to, to further uh, enhance. Um, I'm not going to commit to uh, hubs and locations and buildings, but uh, with the doubling of the number of SDI um, staff in Europe, that's a, a key indication of where we want to be. But um, we've been very clear that uh, if we can achieve um, you know, Dublin, which we have, London, Brussels, reconfiguration, and uh, Berlin, that would be a, a, a strong statement in that direction. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart McMillan. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, so there has been a, an additional £17.7 .7 million uh, in the draft budget for major events. And how will this money be spent? And also, how will the government measure the impact of that money and the money previously assigned to major events? I was quite upfront in the letter that I sent to um, the convener because, you know, on the face of it, you might say, oh, that's a very big increase for your budget line. That's good for cultural heritage. But, you know, the, the two big uh, items in that one is the census and, as Stuart, you've, you've um, identified, is on the major events. Now, clearly, there's a, there'll be a gearing up, as there was for the Commonwealth Games, for example, of the budget line support events. Um, so we have the Solheim Cup. Um, and we have the European Championships in 2020, um, and these events, you know, we'll, we'll see over the next, you know, in, until their delivery, a steady increase in terms of the, the funding for that. In terms of uh, the impact, again, I would refer to how we've measured previous activity around, for example, the Commonwealth Games. Um, but you know, these are you know big events. Uh, we are expanding our, our, our tourism and our opportunity to showcase Scotland as a place to come for the perfect stage for for major events um, and there's a challenge because you know having had the Ryder Cup having had the Commonwealth Games we've actually done very well at achieving big uh, big events and, and that's been a cooperative from previous governments and as well because if you remember in terms of starting to try and pitch to get major events you know, you're starting way way uh, much earlier than the actual delivery of the events so um, in terms of the this area the, we've, we've allocated funding that's required for that in terms of the monitoring of that I expect an interest from this committee on that and also at some point um, referring to the, the other big budget line on census as well will work with you as to how the committee wants to be involved or to know the progress of the development of the census as well but uh, it's, early, it's still quite early days in relation to that um, uh, but um, you know, again it's something I'm sure we'll come back to as, as it goes on but this is the first year where you see a major shift in terms of the, the gearing up for, for that event or those events sorry. Yeah. Now, in terms of uh, major events uh, going forward, I posed a question to, uh, to Malcolm Roughhead uh, in the previous session. I know it wasn't uh, particularly a budget-related question, uh, but um, I know it's something that you and I have discussed in the past as well in terms of uh, the, the, the targeted years. Also, the next year in history, heritage and archaeology, 2018 Year of Young People. But certainly beyond that, um, uh, could there be a, a thinking from the Scottish Government to have a, a year of like, marine tourism or marine and wildlife tourism, and then, but also to have uh, some uh, target that as well with some uh, marine events, uh, some of the larger events that potentially could take place? Um, I know the members' uh, keen interest in marine tourism and, and trapping of it. Uh, the same years have been very successful. Uh, in fact, this last year of the Year of Innovation, Architecture and Design, the in amount of attendances at the different events uh, has actually far surpassed the, those that we expected. And of course, it, I think it just reflects that actually there's a real kind of uh, cultural connection with people in place and the buildings that we have in Scotland. Um, and there have been a, a huge number of very successful uh, events, and it allows everyone to, to, to provide focus. Um, on what they can work together. It's quite a challenge doing one every year, so we're thinking about whether that would be a model that would want to continue. 2018 is um, a big year. It's quite an unusual year. It's a year of young people, so it's cross-government, and Mark MacDonald, who is the, he's 
the lead minister for that year in particular. It's been co-produced with young people. We may be the first country in the world to actually have a year celebrating our young people, but it's also an opportunity to say actually Scotland's a nice, you know, great place to to uh, live, work, study, bring up your, your, your children, but also to visit. Uh, and I think, you know, perhaps um, the, the dear Scots and children should be seen and not heard view of our, our culture will be smashed to pieces in 2018 when we you know, put uh, young people centre stage. And I'm very keen from a cultural position we have that, but also for families visiting. And it also allows people to think about a family approach to, to holidays and activity and what can be, what can be done going forward. Um, I think the uh, suggestion of, of celebrating Scotland's marine tourism is a very good one. Um, the only question I'm kind of uh, wrestling with as well, and there are other candidates um, that we're looking at as well, is how do you do something that reflects all of Scotland? And we've got a very extensive coastline, but perhaps something that reflects our ca canals and our lochs and our rivers as well uh, might share share the uh, celebration and the opportunity. Uh, but there's a lot uh, in terms of our uh, outward uh, exploration, a lot of the activity, marine activity, um, really, really strong. Uh, a lot of challenges for tourism uh, post-Brexit. Um, so maybe the opportunity to try and reinforce those activities that work very well uh, there. I, I'm, I, I'm committed to the themed years. I want them to continue, but the shape and form of them we've yet to resolve. That's more of a, a policy issue. But again, in terms of the commitment and the budget, the budget's still there. And of course, we're about to enter uh, the year of history, heritage and archaeology. And there's lots of happening all over. And I would encourage everybody to go on the Visit Scotland website, identify what's in their own constituency. And if you can help promote that, that's a, 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 a great step to help uh, tell the story of Scotland. So that at any time of the year, in any place of the year, Tourists can, either from within Scotland or from the rest of the UK or the rest of the world, come and find out the amazing story that we have to tell. And just uh, one final question for me. Just... I'll leave the oh, Cabinet okay. Secretary's time because I know that she's... Yeah. <laughs> just very, very quickly because I'm, I'm sure. trying to bring in Rachel Hamilton sure. who has asked a uh, question. It's just, uh, once again, it's on the, on the marine uh, area just regarding the, the, the cruise ship uh, tourism uh, and uh, the wider opportunities there. Um, I know the Scottish Government... Uh, are committing funds uh, through the City Deal uh, projects um, set across Scotland. And, the, and there are uh, even greater opportunities uh, in, inside that, uh, in that cruise sector uh, market. And do you think the, the Scottish Government um, has, got the, has got the strategy correct in terms of helping to promote uh, that, wider, uh, that wider opportunity for Scotland? Uh, I, I suspect this is a, a rural... Uh, versus city approach to economic development and, and tourism. And I think we have to try and help support both, which is why, for example, um, in our manifesto, we've got a commitment to the south of Scotland tourism uh, in particular. I'm very conscious of it. I'm also very conscious that throughout any of the city deals that we need to make sure there's a strong cultural heritage and tourism aspect. But of course, the city deals, uh, the impetus and the focus and the priorities for that should come from the lo local government itself and, and the cities themselves. But um, don't worry, I'm very conscious of my responsibilities that actually I think in terms of my uh, portfolio, uh, it's the one portfolio that probably reaches every single part of Scotland from the most remote and the most rural and the most coastal to um, obviously our, our, our burgeoning, vibrant tourism uh, cities. So if you, the answer to that is yes, I'm very conscious of that. Rachel Hamilton. I'd just like to go back to the um, migration strategy budget. And I understand that 150,000 has been transferred uh, to COSLA um, to the migration population and diversity team, which will help them with their uh, immigration advice and, and um, policy support. Um, However, that leaves 480,000 to actually spend on um, promoting and attracting uh, talent and, and skilled individuals to live, study and work here. Um, how do you propose to um, support Scotland's workforce planning, and in particular, um, that's important in the hospitality and agricultural industry in Scotland? Primarily by trying to persuade the United Kingdom government not to have a hard Brexit and to um, go forward with a proposition that supports single market membership and freedom of movement because, yes, we want to have development of our own um, uh, young people and also people returning into the area uh, in terms of the uh, capability for skills. But when you've got something in like uh, 50, uh, over 50% of our hotels and restaurants 
not just in Scotland, across the UK, staffed by EU nationals, the most immediate thing we can do usefully to make sure that we've got the skills pipeline that we need is actually the policy area as opposed to a budget area. It's a policy area of persuading the United Kingdom to ensure that we can continue to have uh, freedom of movement in the single market. And that's a proposition that we put forward this week. So. Um, I, know, I know this is a budget session, but that's probably the biggest impact that we can have. In relation to um, the, the other activity, uh, part of that can be about promotion in country, but you, with the best will in the world, uh, how can we advertise to encourage more people to come to Scotland to live, work and study when the Prime Minister has yet to give commitment to the EU nationals that are, are living here? So I think a lot of the solutions to this has to be you know, the reality check of what the real... The, the, the real drivers that here are, we will continue to try and make that promotion as much as we can to encourage people. So, for example, um, for universities, that we've made the decision that we would honour the tuition for those uh, European students applying for years from the year 1718. Uh, we made the decision very early, about 1617, but it also had impacts on that. So, you know, the open for business, we still want you to come to work and study um, is, is still there. But the paramount issues, how do we how do we get to a situation where we can support our tourism industry with over 17% of the wider tourism industry dependent on EU nationals? That's the one thing. And I was speaking to the uh, Scottish Tourism Alliance only yesterday, and that still is their biggest, biggest concern. So it, we've got to, I think, put it in proportion that we'll continue our business as usual um, promotions, but it really needs a policy uh, uh, position. And I think the, you know, the problem Theresa May has, has, has she lost the moment. Um, had she made that uh, commitment far, far earlier uh, to EU nationals, we'd be in a better position. She tried to get the um, European Council uh, to uh, discuss uh, what would happen to you know British. Uh, migrants are I mean, British citizens uh, working and living in the EU, but because she'd left it so late, and by this time there was you know, no negotiation before triggering Article 50, she left in a position where nobody would say anything uh, and nobody would discuss it. She could have had the opportunity much earlier. Um, so I think we're left in a very challenging position, but uh, that's a policy, you know, I suppose that's a policy solution, not a budget uh, solution. Um, and secondly, um, since 2010-11, there has been an underspend in the external affairs budget of one million. I just wondered um, if you were going to uh, address that issue and how you're going to go about it. I think, I think that reflects the question that uh, the convener asked at the beginning, is that you know this, this is a budget that has to respond to events and to different initiatives that can happen during a year, and there has to be some flexibility uh, within that. And the... Uh, the, 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 the proposed sometimes you know we don't spend for the sake of it so you know for example there may be an underspend sometimes in international development uh, we have over the piece met our commitment um, in relation to uh, nine million a year and three million for Malawi but sometimes in some years it's a, know, you know, we spend more because the, what, if, if people are delivering a program and it's not ready to be delivered within that financial year that would count towards an underspend and um, so therefore you know some of that ha has to do with uh, you know, when programmes are spent where internationally and some of them don't necessarily fit neatly in the financial year so uh, I mean there are I'm not um, I'm not particularly concerned about it, but I do recognise it, and we need to make sure that whatever happens, it's efficient and effective use of, 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 of the Scottish budget, it's public, the pub, public money, but we're not going to rush fund out the door just so there isn't an underspend. That would be inappropriate. It's, it's important that we have effective use of spend, but sometimes that can mean we have to have a bit of year-to-year -year movement on some areas. Okay. Thank you. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. One of the most impressive pieces of evidence we had was from the Artistic Director and Chief Executive of National Theatre of Scotland on behalf of the National Performing Companies, where she says that <clears throat> the head teacher of Port Glasgow High School attributed the 14% increase in attainment amongst one year group to their participation in the National Theatre of Scotland's Transform project that created large scale site specific theatre in collaboration with 20 schools across the country. There's many really good initiatives being carried out by the national performing companies and other cultural and arts organisations, taking our arts and culture across Scotland into communities. And I had a fascinating meeting with Sir John Layton, the Director General of the National Galleries, last week, where I'm trying to persuade him to take some of the superstars to the National Galleries collections to Elgin, for instance. And 
I just would like to have a, an assurance that you think it's really important that those who are getting the budgets are paying due attention to getting our arts and culture into every corner of Scotland and that the really good initiatives that have been happening from the Scottish Opera or the National Galleries over the last couple of years will not only continue to be enhanced so we can get to places like Elgin and other places around Scotland who have perhaps not benefited as much as other places. Um, I'm very committed to, to that. Uh, it's also a key driver in the programme for government and from the First Minister that we tackle inequalities across Scotland and some of that's geographic but some of that obviously clearly is poverty and that's one of the key drivers of what we can try and tackle. I mean, I've seen Scottish Opera, for example, in Bowness, uh, a fantastic outreach and connection. Uh, there's, a, there's probably far more activity happening than I mean, the committee might want to take a continuing policy interest in this area. There's probably more activity than people realise all over Scotland. And also the festivals have told me that they, I mean, they have work across every, you know, every one of the 32 local authorities. So the reach is, reach is there. But remember, you know, part of what we're trying to do is gear up the capability of places to take valuable and pieces of work that require it, it tends to be not necessarily the, the unwillingness to to share but the capability of um, museums and galleries to house in terms of security and the quality of what they have and um, what they can what they can um, what they can receive so Inverness for example the re refurbishment Inverness Castle I'm very keen that, that museums and galleries um, of, of Scotland can, can can showcase there but it has to be the spec of that will have to be such that they can receive it but remember during the Commonwealth Games we had generation um, as part of our kind of arts and culture legacy from that and that went to every single part of Scotland so you had in terms of um, some of the Douglas Gordon exhibiting in Dornach, for example and you had you know every small part of, of and, and if you look at uh, Dunoon, if you look at the refurbishment of the Borough Halls, again it was taken to spec so it could take the Maplethorpe um, photographic exhibition so we, we're getting much better at that reach some of the challenges we have in the budget is um, how do we deliver with the national companies and collections when a lot of their um, spend, particularly in the collections, is on their staff. And we have a large number of uh, lower paid staff in this portfolio, which is why I was very keen if we got a flat line funding has been a very good result in the context of a real challenging budget for our companies. Um, some of the other areas of, of challenge uh, for, for outreach will be the, the Youth Music Initiative has had to take a reduction this year. It's been the only one of the only parts of of my portfolio that hasn't had a reduction over the last 10 years and um, so we've now been had the experience of how efficient we can be in delivering that we have to provide more flexibility in it but I, I am saying to the committee there is a reduction in that line and um, what I want to do is get a bit more coordination that everybody um, is working across the country and I, my, my test and I had the conversation is to, to John Layton when I know that the National Galleries and others are working in the fault house primaries of this world, not just the Edinburgh, whether it's Castlebrae or whether it's Craig Royston or the more obvious places that quite regularly get support because they're, from, they're located in Edinburgh. It's Lanarkshire. I want to know Lanarkshire. I want to know the south of Scotland and other places have that work. But that's quite a strain on them because you know they're also doing excellence. But I, I come back to the point that the research has shown that young people are more likely to be audiences of the future for companies and cultural activity if they have participated, not just seen something but participated in arts and culture at an early age regardless of parental income and that regardless of parental income is a huge thing for Scotland uh, because that's the life cha changes that we can make for people who don't have parents that will necessarily have the capability for, for income wise to be able to take them to, to, to visits. I went to the outstanding Scottish opera production of the Elixir of Love at Elgin Town Hall and clearly I'd like to see some of the paintings going there as well and elsewhere in rural Scotland. Uh, and one uh, local person said to me, because the town hall was packed out for the production, that this is fantastic, this doesn't normally happen in Elgin. And I would just like, and I welcome your comments uh, that you've made so far, that, to know that the objective is to make sure that these things do normally happen in our towns and villages uh, throughout Scotland in the future. Well, you know, I mean, I think in terms of you know, having a flatline budget <coughs> on uh, and no cuts for our national companies and our national collections is, is, is a, good, you know, a good result from, from the budget point of view. From a policy point of view, uh, we also have a commitment in the manifesto to develop a culture strategy and part of the culture strategy, you know, I'm looking to have it based on principles of you know, uh, access and, and, and equity and excellence and actually underpinning 
that is a lot of what you're looking at. Again, that's more of a policy thing going forward. But again, that is an impact on everybody who receives public funding. We'll have to make sure that they're delivering on these areas. I think there's a will to do that, and um, we just have to get better at doing it. Much. I realise you have to answer a question in the chamber very shortly. Um, do we have? In the question, so I better make sure you be there. <laughs> um, can I just do before you go, Cabinet Secretary, just bring you back since you, I was going to ask you about the Youth Music Initiative. Um, what evaluation have you done in terms of how it uh, tackles inequality? There, is a, uh, there has been an evaluation uh, that was published during the course of last year, which we'll make sure and send to the committee. Um, it, it has had a major reach and impact because it reaches all of Scotland, and there are two aspects to it, local authority funding areas, but also additional um, outside of school activity. What we're likely to do with the, the refresh, we've just refreshed the Youth Music Initiative, is to provide more focus uh, on the impacts for those uh, you know, the, the, to tackle uh, inequalities, uh, because we know that that can have the most impact. So the best thing is if I send you the, a copy of the actual assessment of the Youth Music, music Initiative. But it is about um, opening up the world for everybody, and it comes back to that point about participation. It's not just seeing or hearing something, it's actually taking part and having the opportunity to play. Uh, and that's why you know, I've, I've been absolutely adamant right through my tenure as a Culture Secretary to protect it as much as possible. This year it's having to take a reduction because in order to protect the other parts of the budget, at some point, everybody's had to take some reduction at some point. But because we've got the experience and the efficiencies of 10 years of activity, we know we can deliver a bit more flexibly. Uh, one of the changes is that we're not putting a, a limit on P6. Even just seeing it until the end of primary will provide a bit more flexibility for delivery. Uh, but the impact on for young people who might that this might be the only the only ever chance they have to play an instrument, um, I think is transformational. And I think if you see um, the impact of um, orchestras across uh, Scotland. The changes that I now see as an MSP compared to when I first started is it used to be only those students that were um, studying for music exams that would be in the or school orchestra. Now, because of the Youth Music Initiative and the demand it has, it's much wider and it's become a norm for everybody. Um, and I think the, the numbers and, and reach of that. So I can reassure you, I'm absolutely committed to it. Um, it's having to take a reduction this year, but we're just going to find different ways of being able to deliver more effectively and be more targeted. Because the school-based music making reduction goes from 5.8 to 2.1 million. So uh, it seems to be and that would be where most children get get access to the musical no, instrument. No, it's, it's, it, it's, 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 it goes down from 10 to, to 9 over the piece. Um, uh, that won't cut, kick in because of the school year to a bit later. So we'll be able to plan in advance of what we can do with it. But I'm being upfront with the committee that in order to protect the, the uh, portfolios, Creative Scotland's portfolio, who uh, also uh, visit Scotland, the National Performing Collections and the National Performing, as the National Collections and the National Performing Companies, I've had to take some uh, reduction somewhere. Mm. Is it uh, possible for you to write to the committee to explain what evaluation you've done about the impact that it will have? I've, 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 yeah, I offered that at the beginning, was that yeah. there has been an evaluation of it and there has been identification of how successful it is. I'm a, I'm a big supporter of it and I, it's one of the reasons I, uh, for the last uh, eight years that I've had responsibility, I haven't reduced it at all when there's been budget redu reductions right across the portfolio and across government. So at some point we're gonna, we were going to have to adjust. This is the appropriate time to do it because we've now had as much learning from the refresh and the study that we've had, the evaluation, that we think we'll be able to do that in a way that will cause the least... Uh, the, the, okay. the least impact. But I, going back to your point, we want to focus on those young people uh, from in, uh, the, the facing disadvantages where music can be transformational in their lives, and that's actually what the, fo the refocus is likely to do. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. And we'll now have a suspension. We'll close the meeting, rather, excuse me. <laughs> can, can, we, can we agree before we do to um, write to, as the Cabinet Secretary invites us to do? pursue the questions around European Union funding. Yeah.